And uh, I don't know many of you, and I, my name's Ken Butler. I'm the director of Community Regional Planning Program. And, uh, some of you might be here for the first time or first or second time to the City Forum. And if you would like to get uh, apprised on a regular basis and only heard about it by word of mouth, uh, I would point you to Aratusa Bloom. Aratusa, raise your hand. Uh, she would be happy to take your email address and put you on the uh, distribution list for future engagements. We usually have a session every two weeks or four weeks uh, throughout the year. So uh, thank you for coming. Uh, we're starting late today because uh, Dr. David Camp, uh, David came in last night and was gracious enough to work with us as a facilitator this morning in an ongoing effort in the school to develop a diversity plan. And um, we held a work session with a number of our administrative leaders in the school, the graduate advisors, undergraduate advisors, to talk about what are going to be our next steps, short term and long term, to further uh, you know, inclusivity, diversity, community engagement, and all kinds of things that uh, you know, a, a, a high level school should be able to achieve in, this, in a place like Texas. Uh, but we have a long ways to go, and so it was nice to have David as a facilitator. We, we turned loose at 11.45 or so, and he's, uh, he had 15 minutes to prepare this. I don't know quite why we're five minutes late starting, but uh, that's my sarcastic way of saying how much I appreciate his time this morning as well as during lunch uh, to carry on with uh, what he does. We invited him here namely because uh, he has some, some great experiences and, and you know, stories and messages with regard to community engagement, with uh, developing cultural competence in institutions, and uh, if you will, holding public conversations uh, on difficult matters, uh, such as conflict issues, race, ethnicity, and so forth. Uh, he comes first academically, but he's been working professionally quite a bit as a consultant and facilitator. But he got a PhD in city and regional planning from UC Berkeley. Uh, Actually, as a classmate of one of our colleagues, Dr. Liz Mueller, uh, is on the planning faculty. So uh, he's both a friend of the program and a resource of our program. And it's uh, my pleasure to introduce David Camp as someone who perhaps can help uh, other members of the city, and the state, and the university uh, hold public conversations in a, in a more sincere, honest, and meaningful way. So thank you for being here. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Detroit is a very difficult city, 
And uh, I, was, I went to Princeton for, I was there for four years. I was a computer science major and uh, hated it. Uh, uh, but I had, I had a scholarship in it, so I had to stick with it in order to, uh, for Princeton. And after that, I went to work for a Computer Magazine in New York as a journalist. It was my way of leveraging my degree but still getting out. Then I went to Berkeley and entered the uh, master's policy program and then PhD program in city planning. Uh, in fact, the reason I went from whole policy to city planning is because when I told my advisors in public policy that I wanted to get a PhD and look at how the issues of um, race and culture affect uh, public policy and institutional decision making, they said, what are you talking about? We don't think that's a very difficult question. So I don't know if anybody's here a PhD student, but you don't want to be in a department that thinks your questions are illegitimate, right? <laughs> so, um, so I went to a city planning. Uh, I was there for much too long, uh, but I finished. And, uh, and it was good that I finished the time I did, because the year I finished, 1997, there was a uh, White House uh, initiative on race by President Clinton. Which I found out at, I found out about as someone from at a Princeton reunion. Uh, so that that whole networking thing from uh, elite school, which I know about, still still helps. And uh, so I applied, and I was one of the few people who actually got the job not through connections but through merit. Uh, but anyway, we had one conversation about that project, how difficult it was. But I was that was a uh, uh, prestigious to have the White House on your on your resume. So after that, I began to consult largely about diversity issues. I had studied cultural competence for dissertation, so that was a natural evolution. Um, uh, at that time, around that time, I became associated with a group called America Speaks as a consultant. The group's still around. And their specialty is very large scale engagements, stakeholder engagement meetings. I mean, large scale, like 1,000 people, 2,000 people, 4,000 people. The biggest meeting I've ever done personally was. Uh, 4,300 people. So everybody's talking to a small group and they use technology to make sure everybody gets a chance to be heard. Which one was that? Uh, oh, yeah. I'm associated with many, many meetings. I mean, and I. 4,300. Oh, 4,300. Oh, that was a meeting at, um, of the AFSCME, the, the Government Employees Union. Um, so uh, I didn't design the meeting, I just facilitated that meeting. So sometimes, sometimes I would design and facilitate meetings. Sometimes I would just facilitate the meeting. But I became very familiar with the process of making, of, of uh, engaging a lot of people um, through my association with this organization. And, and I will call upon some of those experiences as I'm, as I'm uh, talking this afternoon. Uh, but I have, my own, I have my own consulting group called the DWC Group. Uh, some people think it stands for David Wiley Camp, but that's much too narcissistic. So I would like to think of it as. Um, Diversity within communities. Although, of course, it really is David by the camp, but you know. Uh, but diversity within communities sounds better. Um, so, but again, so I do a lot of civic engagement work. It's kind of the rubric under which I do that work uh, when I'm not working for working in a partnership with other people. Um, so, if any of you are consultants, you know how that works. Your, your virtual organizations are coming and going all the time, and you're appearing in different guises all the time. That's the nature of the consulting game these days. A couple years ago, uh, my, I, I got together with a co-author and put together my, uh, some of the wisdom, so to speak, of uh, my experiences in a book called The Little Book of Dialogue for Difficult Subjects, which as you can see is uh, only $5. I don't have any copies right now, but you can get it, you can get it online. Uh, it's from Good Books Publishing. Um, and uh, so it's a 93-page book, and it just summarizes some um, things I've learned about how to mobilize dialogue for various purposes, to connect people, to um, discern the public's will about the issue, etc. Uh, about a year ago, I reconnected with a woman who was one of the advisors on the President's Initiative on Race. I was a um, senior staff person. She was one of the advisors that sort of tried out publicly. And she is the executive director of a group called the Western Justice Center, which is a group out of Pasadena that tries to promote conflict resolution and peace building in various domains, in schools, in communities, in legal systems, etc. So I'm a deputy director there, although I still do consulting work. So that's a little bit of my background. 
Um, I just think for what's necessary, sometimes we have to uh, mobilize dialogue as a conflict resolution tool. So my experience in doing dialogue work has been relevant to uh, some of the work there, and I'll call upon some of those experiences as I'm asserting some points as we go. Okay, let's get to substance. So one way of thinking about civic engagement, and I'm not saying this is the only way, just one way of thinking about it, is that might be, you might look at a, a civic engagement project as having kind of four phases. Um, you have to do some initial investigation and sort of do some preliminary design work to kind of get, you know, understand the landscape and then relate the landscape to your objectives and what's going to happen the day of or days of the event. So there's a kind of an initial phase that you might, that you might call initial investigation and preliminary design. Once you have a kind of a vision of your, of your process and how it relates to the, your objectives and the social landscape that you're really trying to help, then you can move toward positioning the event and doing some outreach work to get people to come to the event. Of course, there is your actual event, which has a process design that needs to be good and that needs to be facilitated by some people, by some person or people. And then, of course, there's the follow-up and forward, building forward momentum. So what I want to do is to just illustrate some lessons that I think are important to keep in mind about each of these phases, and I'll do so by relating some stories uh, from my experiences in doing some of that work. But general things to keep in mind, which I think transcend all the phases, are use elicited processes when you can. So later on today, we're going to use these electronic keypads as, as, a, as an example of that. There's other ways of doing that. But as a general matter, my sense is the more you can use a list of processes, the better off you are. Uh, be humble or at least act humble. It is important to, it is, it is, it is uh, really important to actually be in a stance of learning. Um, but it's even more important to be perceived like you're in a stance of learning because ultimately um, communities need to believe that you're not just coming with a prescribed answer about what they need, but you're actually learning from them. It's better if you actually believe that. And so if you actually believe that, then it's important to bring that to your, to your, to, to all phases of the process, which is why I have to keep in mind. And uh, last one, although this whole thing is not about you, perceptions of you and your team matter. They matter a lot, and they especially matter a lot if you are if you look different or are a different demographic group than the community you're trying to help. So, as your staff, as you're putting together your staff, doing the various phases, remember who you are matters, and how you perceive, and that matters. And you might do that, you might have to make some decisions about that to make sure that it works positively in your favor and doesn't breed skepticism uh, and questions and resistance as you're trying to uh, serve the community. Okay, clarify the limits of the discussion oh, for the initial investigation preliminary design. One lesson, it's important to clarify the limits of the discussion while pushing for openness and difficult results. So let me just tell you a story about that. And I'll tell you about a story that uh, uh, first about a uh, American speech process that I was not heavily involved in but it is, it's nationally significant. So, I think it was in 2002 or three, not after, not long after 9-11, um, the New York Redevelopment Agency wanted to do some work on what are we gonna do with the Ground Zero site? Now, you can imagine there's a whole bunch of stakeholders, right? There's, there's survivors of those who died, there's the businesses that were there, there's the the, the residents in the surrounding area, there's the whole architecture design community, there's environmentalists who want to say, wait a minute, this, we need to think about this from, from redesigning this urban environment standpoint. There's a lot of people involved. So, you know, it's clearly, um, um, you have to have some sort of coherent closed process for coming up with the design, but you want a process by which people can weigh in on it. So how do you construct all of that? And, and so, uh, American Speaks had the fortune of getting some massive millions of dollar contract to have a very large meeting 
which actually was great from a American Speak standpoint because it, like, it, this was in, on the New York Times, right? They, they got 4,500 people to come to Jacob, Jacob Jackson Center and give feedback on these plans that had been generated over the course of a year. Now, part of the dynamic that happened between the American Speaks and the people who were signing the check for the meeting is that the people signing the check for the meeting were reluctant to get feedback about their designs. They didn't want to get feedback that people didn't like the designs because they invested a lot of money in paying planners and architects to come up with designs. So American Speaks had a kind of back and forth to try to push them toward a stance to as much openness as possible but of course, they didn't, there was a, a, a client did not want to end up in a process by which they would have to start over. So, um, in that back and forth, of course, American Speed is in the role of they're getting paid by this client, but they're trying to serve the public. And so that, that tension of how much openness do you push the client to have versus can you sort of get this done and make the client happy? Is something they just had to manage. They were able, they were able to design a process <coughs> that was open enough that you got the result of these 4,500 people saying, uh, 4,500 people saying, we don't really like any of these plans, right? So you do need to go back to the drawing board with some clarity, with some specificity that we have said about what the plans need to be. But there was a certain amount of starting over that was a result of the democracy that American Speech created in, in its because his plan was it pushed the client to put certain questions on the table and to be open to results, right? So the, the, I, the, the core point I'm making is a discussion is going to have limits, but if you're trying to, you, and you as an organizer of a process, you're serving both the client who's paying the check and you're serving the public, and so there's going to be some tensions around that potential. Now, it doesn't always work out. It doesn't always work well. We, Mega Speaks also for a while was negotiating a contract with Columbia University. Now, uh, for those of you who know New York City, Columbia University has a whole bunch of property. It has a whole bunch of property, and there's a fair amount of resentment about that in the area, in, in the areas where Columbia exists. So, so Columbia wanted to do a American speech process to engage a lot of people, basically to, because they were doing, they were going to grab more property and do a redevelopment. So they wanted to get community approval for that. Um, and um, so they can move forward without, you know, pickets and protests and all that. So in our preliminary work, we would go to the community and have some small meetings to try to clarify what are the issues and how are people in the area perceiving both the development, the, the preliminary development plans, the fact that Columbia was wanted to expand, and could we craft a conversation that would actually serve the public and Columbia's interests. And after working this problem for about four months, and we're doing this with Columbia because they're going to us with going with us these meetings, Columbia concluded we don't need that long process. Essentially there's too, too much community resistance. They were just going to have to bite the bullet and do what they wanted to do and just deal with it. Because we could not have an authentic public process that would really get where the really elicit where the public was coming from and have that be have any integrity and still like serve Columbia's needs to get clarity about what needed to happen. It wasn't it was not gonna work. So the point I'm making is, is that as a person who's doing civic engagement, you need to really keep in mind, think about what limits this conversation, how far can I push the client, and what am I likely to get if I'm gonna have an authentic process where people are not gonna feel manipulated and abused and therefore in the long run you look bad because you've constructed a process where you didn't put everything on the table. Um, so that's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, along with that, as your process becomes clear, as you start to see what kind of process you want to use as, uh, uh, with, in a civic engagement exercise, it is very important to get feedback from community informants. Now sometimes with very big projects, as Rick Murray Speaks does, the, the budget on the project is so big, you know, millions of dollars, you have enough money to pay consultants like me to do a simulation of the design. Right? So we come up with what we're going to do in a small group process that we're going to replicate hundreds of times because we have thousands of people. But you still are having an encounter with 10 people. They're going to work through a problem. You want to make sure that, that the way you're constructing that, the information you're giving them, it all makes sense. So they have a coherent outcome. Now, um, again, in those really 
high dollar projects, you might have enough money in the whole budget to actually gather together a focus group of people and try it out. And that's great because you can learn your process doesn't work. It doesn't, people are not, they don't have enough information, they don't have enough time, they, they have too many, too many, uh, your, the premises that you have, that are constructing the conversation, they don't agree with, so they want to fight the process. You can learn that if you do a simulation. Now, sometimes you can't do that because <clears throat> much of the project isn't big enough. So, what do you do then? Uh, oh, I just mentioned, by the way, um, let me give you, uh, for that simulation one, uh, as an example, we're going to speak to the project in New Orleans called the UNOP, uh, the uh, One Unified New Orleans Plan. And basically, what had happened after Katrina was various groups in the city had come up with various redevelopment plans. The mayor had his plan, the council had his plan, uh, various other folks had their plans. And the foundation community, the federal government, said, wait a minute, we don't want, first of all, this is New Orleans. Y'all have a little bit of a history of corruption. So we are not going to like start writing checks until there's a unified plan. So American Speech was engaged to come up with a unified plan. Now, again, part of the difficulty of designing this meeting is, as you may or may not know, <coughs> a huge portion of the people who are at the lower end of the economic spectrum were the ones who were displaced from New Orleans. So how do you have a meeting in New Orleans, about New Orleans, that's just in New Orleans, when in fact a whole bunch of the stakeholders are not in New Orleans? Well, what happened was we had a five-city satellite and satellite connected meeting, another massively expensive meeting. So we had we had um, I'm trying to remember the sites. We had 12, 1,200 people in um, in New Orleans, and we had a whole bunch of Baton Rouge, and we had some in Dallas, and we had some in um, Houston. Yeah. So I can't remember. It was like five different places, and it was it was a great meeting. Um, but we still had to. Um, we still had, we had to make sure our process made sense. So we actually uh, went to Baton Rouge and did a sim simulations of the small group process. Went to a couple of places that we did it. Actually, we did it to Houston too. And we got some um, feedback about our process that was very important to get. Um, and also, some, I'll, I'll some feedback we got about difficult issues that I really want to um, raise in a little bit. Um, in cases where you can't really do a simulation of your process, maybe you don't have enough time, you don't have enough money, etc., uh, it is valuable to get a, what I would call super facilitators, people who really understand group process, and to have them kind of on your team with you and who know the community, and they can at least give you some feedback about your process that you know your, your um, that. You can't just get from a sort of an uh, average Joe or Jane because they're not necessarily familiar with the intricacies of process design. But if you have somebody who's who you bring on board to your team, and you might have to pay them, but you might be able to find somebody who has those skills, who's willing to volunteer for the community effort. But you really want to tap into them to make sure that what you're coming up with is going to work, because you don't you don't want to find out it doesn't work on the day of the event because you. Uh, for a whole bunch of reasons. It undermines people's sense of uh, engagement. It, it makes the next person kind of civic engagement, uh, it makes the job more difficult. You want to do is get as much intelligence as you can about is this process likely to work? Where are the holes in it? And if you can't do simulation, have somebody with you who really understands group process to give you some feedback about it before you do it. Um, and the last thing I just want to say. This is especially true when you are uh, going in the community. When you're an outsider in the community, you want to inquire about and be open to how you're likely to be perceived. And you don't want to um, you don't want to ignore what you're hearing. Now, that doesn't mean you believe everything you hear, but you don't want to ignore it. So, um, in a whole bunch of communities that we care about because they're underserved, let's face it, we might look different than them. And there's a whole history of people from the outside coming in. Well, I'm going to help you now. All the other people, you can ignore them. I, but I am going to help you now. And that's beautiful, but we still live in a racialized society. We live in a class, uh, a, a, a society with class hierarchies. And so it is important to be open to how am I being perceived and to find people in the community who can give you feedback about that and perhaps can give you some advice about how to mitigate 
those issues if they are problems. It is important, it's important to be open to that and not just to think that people are crazy if, um, if they don't like you because they don't understand your great intentions. Can I ask a question before you go? Sure. What were some of the things you learned during that simulation in uh, Baton Rouge, the dry run? What, what, was, what needed tweaking as a result of what you learned from that? Um, one of the things that we had to do was um, we actually shortened some time frames of process. You know, the, the part of the dilemma in this kind of, in this kind of uh, design, that, so just, just to make sure people know, you know, it's basically a, you know, you go from this plenary presentations and people do some reading of a, reading about an issue, we'll talk about discussion guys in a little while, then you have people kind of process, just have people, uh, give people a task and process it, the information from every table goes to a central place, you feed it back to the group, people vote on the results, right? So you have to make decisions about how many issues you cover in a day and how long you give people. You don't want to give them, if you give them too long, you don't cover as many issues. But if you don't give them long enough, you don't get some substantive engagement. So what part of what would happen is that on some of the issues that we have, I can't remember exactly which ones, we realize we're giving people too much. People don't need that long to cover this issue which means that we can save time for more issues. So it's that, that, was, that was one tweet. Another tweet, that I was going to talk about this later, but I'll tell you now, is um, one of the things that we, there, there were two central hard topics that we wanted to, that we knew set the atmosphere for this conversation. One was that people were grieving. Because remember, a whole bunch of people are displaced. Half the people were not in the world anymore. So, and, 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 and a huge portion of people actually, like, they knew people who actually died, right? So, how much do you, how and how much do you go at that if you're trying to have a context about how you build the city? That was one central question. Another question is, you're talking about a very racially divided place. How much do you point people at the racial divisions? Because as you're trying to, as you're trying to redo, you're trying to construct some priorities for the future, like inequities, class, and race matter. How much do you point people at that? And what's the, what's the degree to which you, you do or don't do that? So what, one of the things that we discovered with the focus group is that people perceived, uh, please don't raise the racial issue. It's too volatile. Please don't do that. And we were, uh, we were, uh, we were, we were going to, Make it a race conversation because it's a redevelopment conversation. But we were struck by how much people were afraid of the race conversation. Um, so that is so that was that was one finding. Now uh, my opinion is a whole bunch of people, and these were these were primarily people of color, by the way. Uh, my opinion is this is a whole conversation about, about racial dialogue. People often. <laughs> don't want to have a racial dialogue. If they haven't seen a good one, they think they're all bad, so they're afraid of it, right? So, just because they thought that didn't mean that we couldn't have a successful one, but the degree of commitment, of strong advice to not have it was still palatable. Was, so, we, we, so that was something we adapted to. So the grieving question, um, we, uh, the, what we realized is, is that we shouldn't, um, we need to be careful about how we pointed people toward that grief. So what we did was we had a conversation, we had people have a conversation about what do you miss about the old New Orleans? Which gets to the grief, but in a kind of a different way, right? Um, it doesn't ask, well, what have you lost? It's, what have you, it's, it, the, the, the subtlety between asking what have you lost and what do you miss is, is, is subtle, but it's significant in terms of both how one, how individual things and how a conversation goes. So I'm just saying, that's a, those were examples of things that we learned from engaging, not super facilitators who would advise us, who, who they have their own opinion, but an actual group of people who were like the ones who were going to make the tables anyway. Um, positioning and outreach. Have, been, have folks ever been to a public meeting that didn't have as many people as the people expected? You've all been to that meeting, right? So. Um, one of the things I think that we need to surface in the civic engagement world are techniques of outreach. 
And, I, and I'm not saying that it's super complicated. I'm just saying we don't, as a, as a group, we don't do that that effectively. So uh, one, a friend of mine, uh, he has, I mean, he's an album specialist. I'm trying to get him to write a little book of albums. Um, uh, he says there's basically a hierarchy of asks that you need to keep in mind, right? This goes from highest to low. So high is most effective and takes the most time, right? So there's face-to-face -face asks. Amy, could you come to the meeting next Thursday? I'm hoping you can, right? And in fact, I'm hoping you can bring five other people, and we're going to have that conversation eye to eye. Telephone connection, where I actually talk to Amy on the phone, is less effective but still effective. Leaving her a message on her phone is effective but less effective than that. A text message still goes to her is effective but less effective than that. An email or Facebook message, a flyer that she might see, and an internet posting, right? Now, I, I find that a whole bunch of people think if you put up some flyers and put on the internet, people are going to come to your meeting. People of color are not going to come to your meeting. And I'm, I, a whole bunch of places, white folks are going to come to your meeting. But certainly in communities that um, have a <clears throat> cultural aspect that is sort of more relational, you need to try to go as much up the hierarchy as you can. Now, you're busy, you got a lot of things to do. You're busy and you're expensive. What does that mean? You might need to hire people to do that. You might need to hire outreach workers to do that. But however you get it done, it's really important that you remember the hierarchy of ads in terms of what's most effective. I'm not saying you don't use flyers, no. I'm not saying I'm not saying not effective. I'm just saying let's remember that each of these strategies are not equally effective. Right? So if, you're, if you want to make sure that your meeting has the people, the, the people that you want it to have, uh, it's, a, it's really important to keep in mind that there's different levels of ask which take different amounts of effort and have different effectiveness. Oh, by the way, I, I'm, um, just like Patricia did, I'm open to, we don't have to wait to the end for questions or comments. Um, So this is why I already said this. Um, consider the value of paid, well-chosen outreach workers. Right? So just because somebody lives in the community doesn't mean that they're a good outreach worker. Um, you need to, you know, you want to find people who actually have a lot of contacts, have a good reputation, are energetic, and will will execute. Because on some level, the outreach process is about execution. It's a, it's a, it's a you know, this this is what. It's not like we tell marketers to. You got to beat the bushes and ask people, and you got to be willing to do that, and you got to find people who are willing to do that. And and remember, they become in the community. They become the face of the project before the event. So choose wisely. You know that's why I said good reputations. You want to think about what kind of image does this person present? Do they, does, 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 this, does this person want to be perceived by the people trying to get to the meeting? As somebody that's credible, somebody reliable, somebody that's sufficiently that's sufficiently like you now. That's important. Um, and I would also advise that consider kind of a lightly enforced pay for performance. Because you know, the people the kind of people that who do outreach work, they're not necessarily highly paid people. <laughs> they got other things to do. They're hustling, right? They got a part-time job, and I was at other part-time jobs. So Sometimes you need you need to do a certain amount of supervision to make sure that they actually execute the thing that you ask them to do because they got other they got competing priorities too. I've hired outreach workers who did not execute. Now they might have reputation, but just didn't execute because they had other things to do. And I I had I had to learn to you know I'm not on them like a drill sergeant because that's disrespectful. But I'm just saying you have to make sure you have to check you have to do enough supervision to make sure that your thing that you're paying for. Is prioritized, and it's best if you can kind of link the end result to their pay some kind of way. Some kind of way is halfway respectable. Okay, so you're going to get me X number of people. We're going to um, we're going to we're going to know what that number is. I'm going to check with you at a certain point so we can know how many people who have told you they're going to show up. So that they so that at the end of the day, when people would look at the actual count, who, who those lists that you gave me. I'm not saying that you know it's, it's a. I'm not making it piece work. But I'm saying that you want to, that's what I'm saying, lightly enforce pay for performance. You want to have some goals in mind and then some way of checking back and then having a conversation about did this work out or not and how much you're going to get paid. Um, another important 
us, and I think, is outreach messages do not have to be identical, identical, just compatible. So one of my first <clears throat> big facilitations was something called the um, District of Columbia Citizen Summit, number three. That was the first time I was in front of 2,500 people and, and, and designing a big meeting. So D.C. is a very, very segregated city. And um, so you got, you know, the black folks largely live in uh, uh, southeast and some of the northeast, and the white folks in the northwest. And so people all are going to come together and give the mayor feedback about the budget. That was the purpose of the meeting. So, you know, it's because it's so racially divided, um, you know, it's, it's a, so two, two things really happen, right? It's one, it's an opportunity for people to come to talk to their fellow citizens, to a diverse group of their fellow citizens, and it's an opportunity for people to, on some level, talk to the mayor. And one of the things that we started doing was selling different aspects of that to different parts of the public. So, again, we kept one set of outreach videos and flyers, but in terms of people, like, selling it, when we sell it to white communities, we talk more about the community building aspects of it. You're going to come and you're going to sit down with your fellow citizens and we're going to all have this great exercise of democracy where you're talking to people you don't normally talk to and it really going to make the city stronger. And that was appealing. We also talked about, we're talking about to the mayor, <coughs> but a stronger part of the message was what I just said. To black folks in you know, disadvantaged, dis disenfranchised parts of the city, we more emphasize you're going to talk to the mayor. We're going to tell the mayor, this will be your chance to tell the mayor what you want. Right? A very, and you're going to talk to your fellow citizens too and learn from them, but you're talking to the mayor. Now, are those incompatible? No. Are they different? No. I mean, yes, they are different. They're different messages. So the point I'm making is, is that as you're trying to position an event, you don't have to have the same emphasis and positioning to different communities, but they have to be compatible but not identical. Right? So that, that's, that's the, I think, an important insight to remember. And the last one is, um, it seems simple, but we often don't do it, which is you have to make sure the setting is attractive and provides necessities, like translation or language facilitation or child care. Now, I make a distinction between translation and language facilitation in that um, for a large enough meeting where you know you're going to have people who, <clears throat> speak, who don't speak English, you not only want to translate well, you may want to not only just translate what happens from the plenary to them in a simultaneous way using technology, sometimes using whisper translation, although that has its own problems. Um, you already know what whisper translation is, right? Um, but it's best if you can actually facilitate in their language because you're trying to keep them on the same kind of pace as everybody else, right? Which means, you know, you got, you know, you got a thousand people and you know you're going to have 40 Latinos at least, then they should all have their separate groups where they can speak to 40 Latinos who don't speak English that well, who are more comfortable in English. Then you want to let them talk in Spanish, right? Now you still want to, you want to find people who can facilitate in Spanish, give you the information in English because that, the information needs to be part of the general processing of what you're doing. But you want to let the people speak in the language they're comfortable in and, and still make that a part of the overall process, um, as opposed to something where they are going slower and they got to translate everything even at the table level, right? And you know, just your basic like provide childcare. You know, we for example in uh, I did a uh, series of meetings in Omaha, Nebraska, under a group called Building Bright Futures, and basically it was an attempt of the, the, the you know uh, uh, Warren Buffett's from Omaha. Right, so second richest man in the country is from there, and his daughter, she had a lot of money too, and so she led an effort to try to like upgrade the educational system, bring together all these rich folks to say, what are we, what's happening with the education system around here? This, uh, the, the, the black folks in Omaha are doing particularly poorly, even among like black folks all around the country, um, and the Latinos aren't doing that well either. So they wanted to have a new effort to improve the educational system called Building Bright Future. So we wanted to, they had all these people, people wearing suits, meeting for a long time, come with plans, but they said, uh, you know, before we start this, we should probably like get some community input. So I was hired to come to do these community engagement meetings. And um, 
we learn through our preliminary investigation that, you know, for the Latino meeting especially, we need to have childcare because people have people have young kids and, and the additional Spanish trans, the Spanish, trans, Spanish uh, translation as well as facilitation. So we had to find a place that was that was that was a nice looking place um, that was in the community and that we made a lot of visits to childcare and it was uh, where you like. So people, it was amazing. People came out. You know, it was it was it was. Um, one of those wintry mix type of evenings where it's like raining and snowing and it's just really messy. We still had 220 people come out on a, a Wednesday night and a whole bunch brought their kids. And so the, there was a lot of energy in the room and a lot of energy in the child care room. And it was very important that we have that if we're going to have people come to the meeting. And, but when we had the meeting the next week, we had a meeting in the white part of town when nobody bring their kids. It was a, it just didn't, we didn't need that and it didn't happen. So I'm just saying it is important to think about these kind of subtleties that make a difference in terms of people's capacity to attend the meeting. Design and facilitation, phase three. It is important uh, it, that community validators set the tone for the meeting. I mean, you, you, this, is, this is basic, but it's important to do that. Find somebody in the community, if you can, who will open it for you, who, who people the community will trust, and of course their credit is on the line, so you might use, it's going to be important to do some sharing of your process with them first so that they know they're not making themselves look stupid by introducing a process that's messed up. But it's important to do that and not just believe that your good intentions are going to create the credibility that you need. Um, figure out how to use savvy ways to get at tough issues. I mentioned the brief thing for um, you to and the, the, the point of people at what they miss. Um, um, I want to mention, um, so I'll actually mention here the way that uh, polling technology we're going to experiment with in a little while is useful for that. I'll tell you about a meeting that I just had just a couple weeks ago. So um, basically, the point is, is that sometimes polling technology, whether it's in the room polling or electronic polling in advance, uh, online polling, can be helpful in eliciting the difficult things to talk about. So let me tell you about a meeting I had just a couple weeks ago. So uh, a couple weeks ago, there was a drive-by killing in, in Pasadena of this young man named Brendan Jackson. <clears throat> now Brendan is a, was a football player, he's a student, he had a twin brother named uh, no, I'm sorry. Brandon got killed, a twin up brother named Brandon, who was more of a screw up, who was more gang involved, etc. So it was very unclear whether or not this was a mistaken identity issue or a retaliation issue. But anyway, the, the, you can imagine he gets killed on Saturday night. You can imagine the level of upset at the school where he went to on Monday. Fights are breaking out. There's a whole black Latino thing happening because it was thought that a Latino gang killed a black kid. It was difficult. Difficult time. The school had to be on lockdown just to kind of get control of it. People, there were rooms set aside. People would cry. It was just, you know, it was a mess. Um, and in that process, the football players who were his teammates did not have access to the services that that the adults in the community brought to the school. A whole bunch of adults came from various quarters to try to support the kid. But the way the, the way the whole thing went down, the football players didn't have access to that. So. Uh, my organization was asked to come in and try to create a setting for the football players to talk about how they felt. Now, the um, uh, one guy I know who was very affiliated with this community, in previous meetings, he had given me negative feedback about these electronic keypads. He said, I think it's like a game show. You shouldn't use it. I don't like that. And he said that in a public meeting. And so people were like, you know, people thought he was challenging me. I was like, okay, whatever you, whatever you think. So I was, so here's, here's, I'm having a meeting, I'm organizing a meeting that's really trying to support these football players. So I had thought about using the keypads to try to help elicit the people's, people's feelings of these are high school football players. So they're, they're high schoolers, they're tough, they want to talk about their feelings, right? I said, oh, this is too game showing. I talked to a guy, a, a guy who works at the school, another guy, he said, use those keypads to help start the conversation. So I designed a little a little warm-up to the conversation where I asked them questions about their level of anger, their level of grief, um, 
uh, and their, uh, how afraid they were. Because, of course, you know, these are young men of color also, so this, this could happen to them. So we did that for a little bit to try to let, uh, to have people um, express the level of each of those. And then we broke in small groups and were, and had people, we had facilitators we were talking about it. I later on heard from um, the, the coach of the team, and even the guy who had said he hates the keypads, he was like, those keypads were here, <laughs> right? So the point I'm making is that there's different ways to try to get at difficult issues. So even in a setting in which it's really about, you know, this is, this is the green point dying, even using this kind of technology, which is an example of a group process to try to elicit difficult issues, can be very valuable. Um, there's another short example. Um, so I did a process at a theological seminary and a Newton in, um, in, in, in Newton, Mass, where we wanted to do a kind of a, um, assess the level of the sort of people's feeling about diversity issues at the school. And we did a preliminary survey to try to discern that, and we discovered that the older students were particularly unhappy with how diversity issues were going down. And this was actually, this, this finding and other findings was helpful as we constructed a dialogue process. The data from what was an anonymous survey could help animate our conversation. It was very, very important to help drive it. So instead of somebody's perception that that is taking place, the data itself speaks it. And it sort of validates things and makes it more real for people to talk about things that are tough. Um, I would just say, and I'll try to uh, hurry up so we can make sure we have enough time for questions for discussion. A good and objective discussion guide is really key to a process. I can't emphasize this enough. It really is important to spend sufficient energy on designing a document that is going to tee up the issue in a way that's credible and clear to people with a variety of educational levels and ideological perspectives. America speaks at a meeting about um, last June about the budget, our budget, our economy. And it was basically looking at the budget crisis that our country is not dealing with. Right? The fact that you know, uh, we have a huge social, social uh, entitlements, defense, and we spend all our time, and a huge deficit, and we spend all our time talking about like this discretionary 12% of the pot, right? And we, which will never get us to fiscal health. So they wanted to have, they had a multi-city, 17-city meeting to try to have people talk about that. But you can imagine the document that tees that up is pretty important. So they, they, they did a tremendous amount of organizing to get people from a variety of points, ideological spectrum, to come up to agree to an analysis of the budget problem that, would, that people from Tea Partiers all the way to um, Comic Pinkos, right on, could support, right? Um, to, to say this is a credible uh, way of thinking about our budget problem. So they had to get a big advisory board. They had to do a lot of a lot of intense work to come up with a document that could that everybody would think this is an objective, credible thing. And of course, this complexity you've got to manage too, because people, you know, a lot of people can't read past eighth grade levels. So how do you do how do you do that? The point I'm making is this: it's important to come up with again a clear and objective discussion guide because if you're going to try to tee up a conversation, you want to tee it up in a way where you're not going to raise hackles from people who are extremely on the right, extremely on the left, or in some other place on the ideological spectrum. Um, sometimes people try to blow up your process. That's just what you have to face. Sometimes the level of resentment with, with, about the issue and about you is so great that people will explicitly, not just challenge your process, they will try to blow it up. So um, a couple months ago, I was doing a meeting for the, uh, on, Skid, on Skid Row for LAP, LAPD, and they wanted to bring people, bring stakeholders together to have a conversation about, you know, uh, the, the, what, what the police, the police's role in helping the community. But there's, you know, as you can imagine, it's LA, there's a tremendous amount of bad blood between community activists and police. So even though police 
um, the police management has shifted since the horrible Daryl Gates days, still, I mean, it, uh, there's a lot of tension between the police and the community. So for our second meeting, like, it, it was about 30 people, and like, about half of them had little slips of paper that they were that they read off. Like we were we were trying to first have a, a, a little keypad process to listen to issues, including how much what resentments they have about the police and their concerns. And they're like, "You haven't heard from us yet." And I have something to say, and then they would get, they would use it. They would you know, they try to hide it at first, but you, it was, it was pretty, pretty clear. So they would they had little talking points, and you know they were all connected, but not obviously, right? So somebody, somebody clearly had, had purposely tried to undermine the process of the meeting. So at some point, you know, as facilitators, we, we, we could have tried to corral them and say no, but ultimately, our goal is civic engagement. So people kind of blow your process on that time, it has to be blown up. You just have to kind of go with it and adapt and, and give people a chance to do that venting and try to receive it in a, as good of a spirit as you can and avoid being defensive and avoid attacking that. Again, assume, assume on some level that people are rational, and this isn't personal to you. If people start to pull up your process, it's important to do that. You don't want to be in a stance of defensiveness. You want to be in a stance of inclusion, if possible. As an example, at that OPO meeting, we had uh, tea partiers who came to protest the meeting. And what did we do? We went out and try to receive them with love and invite them into the meeting. And in fact, some of them came in and later on said, this, was, this, this wasn't biased. I appreciate this meeting. So again, it's, it's important to not be defensive, not be able to defend about your process and be in a welcoming stance. Um, follow up and moving and forward momentum. Uh, I think it's very valuable if you're doing even one event, you want to find out who our organization, the community, that embody that kind of civic engagement spirit. And even if you didn't work with them on this event, promote them. Because ultimately, you, you have a good experience, you, you, we want the, this kind of momentum of civic engagement to continue. We want that. So, I did a meeting one time in Dallas that was about childhood obesity, and it was very important to me to, to, to talk from the stage publicly about a local group that does civic engagement type of work. Because I wanted people to know that this Thing they experienced, the power of talking to their fellow citizens about an important issue in a way that was civil and coherent and had a result. You don't have to just wait till this very occasion, this, this unlikely event, for the big consultants from Washington to come to town and do the event. You've got people here who are trying to make this a regular part of your civic discourse. So that's important to do that. Um, another way of trying to uh, uh, get what you want out of the event, which might be a one-time thing, and still build momentum, is to have is to pepper or infuse your process with empowered action steps. We kind of had this morning, right? To confront people, have people think about, okay, we just, even if the meeting was about like understanding the landscape of a problem, it is sometimes valuable to have some piece of it of being about, okay, what are you going to do? Like even the meeting is about what they should do, what the public, what, what the public officials should do, what the students should do, it is valuable to have people think about what might we do, both individually and uh, and, and, and collectively, that's valuable to do that because you're trying to promote, again, civic engagement, not just get information to decision makers. And the last thing about this, um, I found it very, very valuable to, if you can generate fast turnaround reports. If people can walk out of a meeting with a piece of paper that shows the results of a meeting, the level of energy that creates is just tremendous. Because people, people go so many meetings and it's just all in the air and well, you'll hear from back from us at some other point or the decision makers will hear about it. If people can walk out with what happened, that is just very, very valuable. The second best is getting it to them the next day or sometime quickly. A lot of people, you know, a lot of people don't have email. But if you can, they can walk out of a room with something, that, that, that makes, that increases the, uh, their positivity, not just about you, but about civic engagement processes in general. Okay, I can, we do the electronic keypad, but it's not critical. I want to make sure we have time for some real discussion. Questions, comments, etc.
Um, I work for the city of Austin and we do a lot of facilitation of meetings. And one thing I've sort of found, um, especially since um, city employees can be viewed not very favorably in the eyes of the public, is that when we facilitate a meeting and we have you know, citizens at the table, um, of course, beforehand we would have worked out how we're going to, you know, elicit the inf information from the citizens. But when I get to the table with the citizens, um, I might say something like, you know, this is how we were thinking of doing this exercise. Um, any suggest any other suggestions on how to do it or any way to tweak this? And that seems to help the people at the table also feel as if we're not just railroading mm -hmm. but having a voice. And I just wanted to get your in input on that technique. I think that's good as long as you can actually adapt it. Right? I mean, I might suggest, if, if possible, um, again, as I said before, the value of simulations beforehand. So if, if you can do that before and sort of know that, that help doing it before prepares you for the possible, for what the people people might say, mm -hmm. and, and it helps you present them with a better process because it's already been sort of pre-vetted, mm -hmm. it's still helpful to do it. But um, what you want to make sure of it is that if you get a consensus around something at the table that you can actually do it and that that doesn't mess you up because like it happens at your table doesn't happen at earth i'm really i don't want to process it but you want to but as a general matter i think more inclusion is better than less so certainly i think that the, the spirit of that um, uh, and the technique of that if you can actually respond to it is very very valuable it gives people more buy-in mm -hmm. how much research do you do if you're um facilitating something on like a really um, detailed topic matter that's not just the real bottom general. So you said that you did childhood obesity, obesity. Did you do background research on that in order to facilitate the discussion or was it not for me what you were doing? Oh, well, I would say that the issue is, <clears throat> well, sometimes it's about the research. Sometimes it's about the presentation of people. The challenge is, I mean, everything has been researched Forever, the, the more of the, or most things have, the, the real issue is how you present it to people in a, in a way that respects the fact that, um, you know, uh, everybody doesn't have uh, high levels of uh, high reading levels. Uh, every, you know, everybody, there's people, people have different levels of cognitive power, right? But you want to, but, but even if you decide that the average person is, you know, smart enough, you, you got to make sure that how you're presenting it is is at the level of complexity that the average person can handle, right? So, so what I'm saying is, um, I'm not saying research doesn't matter, but I'm saying that um, I think the issue is more likely to be the presentation of it in a way that people can grapple with than the research, because every issue can be, can, almost every issue can be researched to the point, to a level of complexity that we can that most people can't discuss. The issue is how can you boil it down in a way that's ideologically fair and not biased, and but simple. As Einstein used to say, you want to make things as simple as possible, but most simpler, right? So you want to you want to get enough complexity where you still look good with the real issue, but the average person can deal with it. So I'm so I'm answering. I'm answering. <coughs> the other end questions or insights for that matter. Mm -hmm. So uh, you said it was really important, you know, who we are and who we're presenting as and how we're seen. So say we are a white person who ends up facilitating a largely black or Latino group. What what would should we keep in mind? Um, I think that um, often it's important or it can be effective to kind of like. <coughs> call out, to, to, to put your humility on display, right, to call out the fact that, you know, um, I'm really happy to do this, you know, I sometimes, I, I, I anticipate doing it, I was sometimes, I was sometimes nervous about whether or not me, a white woman, whether y'all would really accept me as a facilitator, and whether y'all have any resentments about that, that are hard to talk about or not, are not hard to talk about. So I'm just saying, one of the ways to uh, manage it is to kind of like put your own vulnerability out there. Because typically what happens is when you do that, people want to support you. 
People want to deny their own resentment of you because they want to support you, right? Now, you can argue that's manipulative, but I think if you do it honestly, I think that you're just, you're surfacing what is in people's minds anyway. And your aspiration to serve them. Well, one thing I heard you say is, the way I would put it is that you need to engage your, your client just as much ahead of time as your uh, your audience or the, the agency that will be involved. Your client may think they know what they need from you. Mm -hmm. uh, we just need a little bit of managing the conflict so we can get get a decision made. And uh, we already know where we want to go. Can you help us, you know, get through that? When in reality, what, what you're saying is sometimes failure is an option, that or, or not failure, but, but uh, a lot of negative reaction might be an option. And you need to sometimes educate your client as to what the range of Outcomes might be as much as the the uh, the. Well, you got educated. <laughs> <laughs> they realize you know so much resentment. You don't want to have a public process because it wasn't going to work. But I mean, yes, part of it is an educative process, as I mentioned before, with about the listening to the city. America's Peace had to push back and push back on the client, which didn't want to have a lot of openness to the possibility that people would not like the results, not like the plans, but ultimately. I mean, I'm not saying the plans are broken now. I'm just saying that that I think in the end they're, 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 they they consider themselves better off having really heard from the public. So where I'm going with this is there there's a professional ethics issue here sometimes that uh, if I'm a consultant and I make my money doing this kind of work and I've got a client that's going to pay me to do the work, but I can see that this is going to be a compromise of, of of the role I like to play, the, the the options and the respect that is normally imparted to the, the community that I'm going to engage. I may have a real hard time both taking income for this job and mm -hmm. doing the job the way the client expects it to go. And uh, that's a hard choice <coughs> to say, you know, I'm not going to take this job. I'm not going to make the income I would make because I want to hold on to, you know, right. from an ethical point of view, the way things ought to be. Uh, I'm not saying it's just so easy as to well, say. No, it's, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's never the black and white, they're yeah. difficult. Yeah. But, but you have to be mindful. What you do in your civic engagement affects how people perceive civic engagement in general. Uh-huh. Go ahead. You talked about uh, at some point of the process of uh, working with community validators. That in a way they're kind of insiders from the community that are collaborating with you. Uh, how much that relationship is a difficult one that could get alienated as the process goes along, and how do you kind of treat this relationship? Um, well, there's two, <coughs> two types of uh, folks, just to be double to clarify what I meant. Um, one, I wasn't the same type of people who are really collaborators, although you need those, but you need people in the community who they can give you, like, they're, 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 they're somewhere between the super facilitators and the big wigs in the community. There are people who can sort of validate your process as it is going. Those are more collaborators. What I meant by the community validators, I was really talking about, I mean, again, I don't want to make too many hierarchies. People who at your event give the event credibility, which you don't have to, they're not necessarily collaborators. They, they, they might just see a big picture of the project so that they know they're not going to embarrass themselves and will speak on it publicly and hold down the weight. They have a lot of credibility in the community. They, 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 that's, that's what. So I just want to clarify the slight distinction between people who have that kind of symbolic weight on the, on the day of an event. I mean, just like this morning, you know, I mean, it's a small, small, small version. You can't introduce me to the diversity team as opposed to introducing myself, right? Even though they came to me, just because it, it carries that kind of weight. Now, um, there can be complexities with those other people who are not necessarily the daily event people, but people who uh, who you're working with, whom, and they might be related to people signing the checks for the event. You know, again, sometimes it, it comes about what Kent was talking about, is that sometimes those people don't want to put certain issues on the table. And then again, you're, you're that same that Biden was just discussing about, you know, um, how far, you know, they they might want a process that's going to serve certain objectives, and 
you as the client want to serve the public, they're part of that. So I'm not, so that can get touchy. I mean, I don't have an easy answer for that. That, that, that can get touchy. I just want to clarify though, the difference that I meant about that. Mm -hmm. A similar question. Um, you know, you're working with uh, perhaps community members who are volunteering uh, to participate in this event, either as a um, process designer or outreach. Um, and as a community member, they have an opinion, or it could be even stronger, maybe they have a bias. Um, how do you work with them through the process? They have a bias. It's important to, um, okay, a couple things. One, if you're trying to get people to help with the process design, that, that is a very, um, that's a very subtle thing. And it's important to choose people who, who can put their biases aside. That is really important to do that. So there could be, um, there could be people who, you, who is helpful to support your process, and you want to balance off those people with certain bias, perhaps with other people with a different kind of bias, and say, look, we're gonna, you, you want to convey to them your objectivity, the fact that you have as minimal biases as, as, minimal bias as you can, and what you're trying to do is to elicit the, the public support. So you, it's almost like you have to persuade them that um, if, giving a, if given a fair hearing, you, their, their point of view will prevail, right? And you might tell people on the other side of them, you know, if given a fair hearing, your point of view will prevail. My interest is in trying to create a fair hearing. But you don't want those people necessarily on your process design review team. Some people could be on your outreach team. This is those different levels anyway. But when you are really trying to figure out whether your process is too tilted, it's really valuable to try to get people with a certain version of intellectual honesty. And there are some people who are sophisticated, they don't have, an, and not honesty, but they're not so dedicated to their point of view that their point of view is more important than the integrity of, a, of a, essentially a group mind process. So that doesn't mean they can't be your allies. It just might mean that you have a, you're somewhat, you're a little bit more disciplined and relate them to a different way. It might be helping you promote the process generally, and you balance your relationship off with them with your relationship off with other people who are different than them, who you, again, you persuade, y'all might win in a really fair public process. Okay, so we have a process dilemma. <laughs> By my reading, it's like 118. We can talk more, we can stop. We can do the little keypad thing, which is so fun to do. <laughs> um, which is illustrative of a kind of listening process that, that, I, uh, uh, that I think is very valuable. It'll, it'll probably take about 10 minutes, no more than that. <laughs> okay, let's pass it on, let's do it. Right? 
Your job as facilitator is to keep mindful of diversity, but people in general don't do that, right? But this force, this is pushes group attention to the group diversity, and you can also know who isn't here. That's very important too. Okay. Uh, uh, they're having a particular thing for racial dialogue, but that's not important. Um, you can use some issues, facts, build a learning environment, build group connectedness, get diverse experience on the table, solicit perspectives, including something hard to say, spark dialogue, summarize it, get ready for decisions, or even to create laughter. Um, okay, raise the use of that already said. Okay, four types of questions, fact questions, what do you know, demographic questions, what the demographic group are you in, experience questions, what have you, what experiences have you had, and the opinion perspective questions. Okay. Um, a little about the questions, you can you want to know who's here and who is not here. I think people inherently are always asking questions when it comes to who are these other people in the room. Um, sometimes there are questions about visible diversity. The two useful large means you can see where you are from in terms of these visible diversity issues because it's hard to see past more than a few people. And sometimes it's useful to know about invisible diversity, like where you're from, your income, etc. How long have you lived in Austin? Five years or less? This, this is this question for you. 5 to 15 years, press 2, 1 to 15 years, press 3. Okay, right gone. Excuse me, oh, we do just, is there like a go key or something here to log in? Just hit the letter. Don't, just hit the letter, I should have said that. Okay, so just press the number, don't press go. Okay. Okay, so you can see, that 60% of us have lived here for five years or less, and another 20 and 20. So we can see we have diversity in here, but it's skewed towards newbies. <laughs> How which of these groups identify yourself? White person or person of color? Press one for white person, two for person of color. What do you see on your monitor, David? Hmm? You see the growing number in the... No, I don't know. I just, I'm just looking at what you're looking at. What happens if I punch it 14 times? It enters the... Um, you can make a mistake, and, but it enters the last one. Um, sometimes I say, you can vote as often as you want, but unlike Chicago, only your last vote counts. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so we see our, our, uh, our distribution along those lines. How would you describe how your political ideology falls on the left-right spectrum? Far left, like Che or Mao, press 1. Left, like Bernie Sanders, percentage, press 2. Left to center, like Obama, press 3. Center, like Arnold Specter, press 4. Right to center, like Joe Lieberman, press 5. Oh, that's just being right, it's not Ronald Reagan. Right, like Ronald Reagan, press 6. Far right, like Stalin. That's like Stalin, like Che or Mao, this is an edit problem. Far right, like Joseph Stalin, press uh, 7. Something else altogether different. Like Ron Paul press eight. <laughs> Looks like we skewed to the left. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I would I would imagine thinking about remember those those horrible um, meetings about uh, health uh, about health care in two thousand nine. Imagine if those meetings, if the public official who those meetings had started out with this. Yeah. Let's see who's here, who's not here. What you would have seen is those meetings, those meetings are skewed to the right. To the right. And, and you, you, could, you could have this, and then you could have, like, you could to put up, okay, how does that compare to who's in my district? So, so imagine how that might change the energy in a room. Because all those people who came there are thinking that they, you speak for me. No, I don't. I speak for you and everybody else. And here's who's here. I want to deal with y'all right now, but let's remember who I'm serving, which is the entire district. But that, doesn't, but that just means that people are answering it correctly, that are honestly. Well, why would, okay. Well, I'm just saying, if you have, you know, far right people and, you know, wanting to influence a room and you want to show that they are there and that they are disproportionately uh, represented, then if they know the point of this exercise, they'll just say, well, I'll just pretend that I'm center, or I'll just, and, you know what I'm saying? They could do that. 
I, I, that, that is possible. I think that most people wouldn't do that. I think most people, if you, if you put a, a thing in front of them and you say, um, where are you on the spectrum? They're going to answer that question honestly. So you, you, can ask, you can game any system, but I think most people would, would be honest about that. Now, I mean, no, but it could be that in the fourth meeting, you know, people realize that <laughs> yeah. that could happen. But it's still important. It's still important to, um, to as, as, a, as a convener, to use that information well. Oh, you know, like to, to not be, okay, I did a little bit of attitude just now. Mm -hmm. A little differently. Oh, wow! We're, this, this is a public meeting. We're, we're seeing that we're more on the right side. This is great. I'm really happy to be in a room to hear from this important part of my constituency because I represent everybody. So I think it's really great that we're hearing from people who tend to be Republicans. And I'm a Democrat. This is great. I, I don't normally get to do this. Now, that's very different than y'all ain't nothing because you're only half of the community. But it is saying, <laughs> it is saying we're, we're all remembering who's here. So later on in the meeting, when I say, when, when, all, when the, when the um, vituperation goes up and you don't represent, represent me, I can easily and I can non defensively say, well, this is really, really valuable. I need to have some more meetings where we get a diversity of people here because I'm, I'm hearing from this part of my constituency and you guys represent that, I get to. But of course, my, my, as I showed you, there's more than, there's more, there's different types of people in this community. So I'm just saying, you know, it's a, I'm not saying we couldn't game the system and that solves everything, but I am saying that I think that this kind of um, insight about who's here and who isn't here, it, it takes the steam out of some people's self-righteousness about what my politicians should do. Okay, fact questions. It can be useful for getting people to more fully engaged facts that you consider critical, and it's also useful to create a learning environment. Because people often know less than they think. Detroit is the most racist segregated major city in the country. That's a, that's a, uh, that should be a um, statement. Which is the closest percentage of the population within the city limits that's black? You think it's 55%, 65%, 75%, 85%, or 93%? Black. 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 The correct answer in black is 85%. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's that racially divided. Um, okay, what's the closest to the portion of the U.S. population that is non white right now? What's the closest? 15%, 25%, 35%, 45%, or 55%? No, no, y'all won't get this right. <clears throat> y'all, UT Austin, y'all very smart over here. <laughs> oh, y'all made the same mistake I made, which is overestimating the portion of the population that is non-white. Right now, not what it is 20 years from now, right now, this nation is 33% non-white. So we can think about what is the implication? And this is the mistake that groups make all the time, right? So we can think about what is the implication of that. What is the implication of that for people's view of public policy if people think that the, that the country is more colored than it actually is? Like how does that affect how people view affirmative action, any kind of distribution process, etc.? If, if, if people think it is more colored than it is, how does that affect that? Like I used to, when I was in the White House, I, I tried to promote this question being asked at every race dialogue, just as an educated thing. Because this is the mistake people make all the time. This, this, is the, this is the pattern. Okay, experience questions. You can start to reveal uh, people's, the background to percentage of facilitators and it highlights the diversity of experience in a room to the participants. How many moderate to large public forums, 50 or more people in Austin, have you attended? Five or fewer, press one, six to 20, press two, more than 20, press three. You were attended, you were in the room, whether you ran it or a citizen or what have you. Great. Okay, so half of us have been to only a few. 
But this, and Fermano's been to more than 20, okay? So, uh, city, city engagement of all of us, very nice. Opinion questions? Okay, can you ask a quick question real quick about mm -hmm. the race question? Because um, I'm wondering, though, if that overall race question is influenced by also specifically where we live. So, like, if you live, you know, so I wonder if it should be a two-part question. You know, where you live, what do you think is the proportion of the non-whites? And well, then you could ask the white person. But I mean, you could be there. I'm saying I think that would help people separate between what they see just generally around them versus what it is throughout the United States. Because when I lived in San Antonio, it was clearly, you know, more minorities than whites, more 65, 70 percent. So if I, you were asking that question when I was in San Antonio, that's what would be coloring my answer to that question. There's no question that what you see um, affects the question, but y'all read the question. Yeah. You, you knew I was asking about the nation. So I got you, but you read the, you read the question. <laughs> but it's also really interesting is that sometimes facts don't matter. Perception is reality. Yeah. We believe we're living in a more colored society. We are acting different than even if we know the facts. Right. We're almost done now. Have you ever noticed um, a difference in the general answer to that question, whether it's an uh, audience that's mostly white or an audience that's mostly of color? You just uh, I think white folks do a little bit more, but everybody on resumes. <laughs> All right. Generally, what is the quality of public conversations that occur in low-income minority communities in the Austin area? In your own personal opinion. Very good, good, okay, fair, poor, or you have no idea. You can I answer the same way, Ben? What's that? <laughs> to Leah and I, people have answered that question the same way. Okay, well, they get the votes in now. Okay, so uh, we don't think it's that good. <laughs> Thirty-eight percent think it's more, and thirty percent think it's fair. Uh, interesting though. Some of us say it's very, so somebody in here says it's, it's, uh, it's uh, very good, very good. Somebody thinks it's okay. All right. So we're not that up on that. Got you. How do alum, how do you see alums do a civic engagement in public conversation versus non UT alums? In terms of when, when, when these folks are the conveners, you know, we're, we're when, when as far as what you know. Now this is, we're asking the question to reflect upon us as an alumni group. Who does civic engagement versus people, other people? What do you think? We're much better than others? Some are better than others? By the same as other, others? Others are better than us? Others are much better than us? Or you have no idea. So we're really asking your assessment of how we're doing as a community on this issue versus other people who are doing this kind of work.
is why I should use a different format for this. But uh, so it looks like the let's see. If we look at the red and the blue, it seems like the more meetings you've gone to, the more likely you think the meetings are good. <laughs> right? Am I saying that correctly? Well, the blue one, the blue one is more than 20 meetings, right? So that's 50% of those people, 25% of those people, 25% are in the in the um, in the fair to good. Whereas if you've gone to fewer meetings, you're most likely to be you no idea or, I mean, you know, this is not a big skew. I'm, I'm, the, the point here is that you can, uh, the final is important to show you the process, which is that by using these keypads and asking questions in a smart way, you can learn a lot of things about who's in the room, who's not in the room, what their opinions are, and how their, how their opinions are affected by various experiences they have. That's the point I'm trying to get across to you. Well, I really appreciate y'all's time today. Thank you very much. Thank you. How long would it take to do a survey of that nature for 30 people? How long? If someone were to do it hand by, you know, on paper? Yeah. What would be the time it would go? By other traditional means. Well, then analyze it. And analyze it. Right? Oh, it's neat. It was good. Yeah. I don't know. It would be. Um, it's a cell phone.